just we'll just leave that um, in the in the background here, and I'll talk. Uh, in fact, overlapping a, a great deal with Gregoire about operational images and forensic uh, forensic methods. So I have two answers to the question: Where is war now? The first answer would be on a screen, and the second answer would be in ruins, which I mean more or less literally. But neither of these uh, answers are particularly obvious, so my task will be to explain them to you. So we could start by saying that uh, measured against traditional understandings of war, the time and space of war have shifted, or better been doubled in some way, from the battlefield, from the ground level, to the surface of the screen. This is virtually a cliche by now, a postmodern cliche, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not true. Today, war is fought with images, and not just the campaign for public opinion and political mobilization or threat or terror or propaganda. Information operations, as they're called, are an essential part of military strategy and even of tactics. But war is also fought with images in the more direct sense. The machines that fight wars are prodigious producers and consumers of images. That conjunction between war and cinema that Paul Virilio long ago described has become embedded at the heart of con contemporary military operations. And I mean operational. Images now operate in the strong sense many advanced weapon systems, often images unseen by human eyes or if seen only later in the aftermath of their operations. Some time ago, the photographer and theorist of photographer, Alan Sekula, looking at First World War aerial photographs, outlined their ideal mo mode of functioning as follows. Few photographs, except perhaps medical ones, were as apparently free from higher meaning, and he puts higher in quotation marks, in the common usage. They seem to have been devoid of any rhetorical structure. But this poverty of meaning was conditional rather than imminent. Within the context of intelligence operations, the only rational questions were those that addressed the photograph at the indexical level, such as, is that a machine gun or a tree stump? In other words, the act of interpretation demanded that the photograph be treated as an ensemble of univalent or indexical signs, signs that could only carry one meaning, that could only point to one object. Efficiency demanded this illusory certainty. The systematic investigation of a landscape for traces of an enemy, coupled with the destruction of that enemy, was surely a mechanical process. Reading, as it was ideally defined, consisted of a mechanical coding of the image. It's the end of that description. So reading becomes mechanical coding. The ideal goal of such an interpretive machine, then, would be to incorporate the reading of the image into the very technology that generates it in the first place, to produce images that arrive before the eye bearing their own translation into the terms required for intervention. And then to link that directly to the means of intervention. So Sekula insists that images are not transparent, that they require interpretation and so on, but he's interested in this moment when the translation or the interpretation seems to be capable of being mechanized because the aim of that interpretation uh, is so simple. The conditions of their use, of the use of these images, generates then a particular rhetorical structure that verges on transparency. This demediation of the image, the rendering non-mediatic but transparent of the image, is more or less accomplished, he says, in some battlefield situations, where the image represents elements of the real world successfully enough to allow their targeting and destruction. 
And in, it, and in its machinery, its mechanical reading, it tends toward a system in which the loop between production, interpretation, and reaction can be further and further reduced, closed even, to a point where the image would no longer require reading in anything like the sense we currently mean. So, I forgot some images here. These are, uh, today all sorts of images are at work that do not require human eyes to see them or to function. They do it themselves. So these are uh, automated cargo scanner images. Just show you a group here. It's from an airport. Those are, they're, my images are out of sequence, I'm sorry. Those are the World War I aerial photographs that Sekula spoke of. And I'll tell you what this is in a second. So for instance, automated images. Robots assemble cars in automated factories using combinations of live camera feeds and object recognition software to ensure that the robot and the car move at the same speed and that each added part fits into the right space. That's somewhat like the airplane images that uh, Gregoire uh, showed us. Cruise missiles fly to their targets using global positioning system da data, as well as by comparing, and this is also an example from Faroki, stored three-dimensional terrain maps of their flight path with real-time imagery as they fly over the territory depicted in the map. The software is called Digital Scene Mapping Area Correlation. Course corrections happen automatically generated by the image correlation. So there's a map in the brain of the cruise missile. There's a camera that's scanning the landscape. As it matches them, if they don't match exactly, it corrects the path of the missile so that the image matches the map, so that the map matches the territory. And finally, this is my third image. I'll just show it to you very quickly. This is the uh, French cargo resupply ship visiting the International Space Station. This is the docking maneuver. Oops. So that's an entirely automated process, the meeting of these two large objects uh, um, orbiting the Earth. The International Space Station and other orbital platforms are now regularly serviced by automated cargo vehicles. Although the docking could be remote controlled from the ground by a human with a joystick or something, the berthing of the cargo craft is in fact done automatically with the cargo ship being guided to the right spot on the space station by images that capture reflected laser light and respond to them by manipulating the thrusters on the arriving vehicle. So I'll show it to you again. You see where it lands? It lands on a dot there, or very close to a dot. It lands inside the dot. And I'm backing up now. That little circle is the dot. So what's happening is the vehicle that arrives is beaming a laser light at the space station. It's reflecting off that dot. The image, the software is reading where the reflection comes back and hits the camera, and it knows then whether it's on the correct path in or whether it needs to move. And if it moves, it moves automatically. The reflection of the laser light back from the dot makes the thrusters move to adjust the uh, path of the vehicle. So it's completely the action, the representation, the taking of the picture, and the movement of the vehicle that's taking the picture all happen inside the same loop. Right? The image drives the cargo ship into the, into the dock. So you say the, these images are not simply uh, from or of something that's flying. The images are doing the flying. The images are flying the cargo ship. So what's interesting is that none of these images need to be seen by human beings. We're just uh, overlooking, we're looking over the shoulder uh, here of the machine which is doing the seeing. 
So this is one place where war is now, on screen and increasingly autonomously, fought on, on screen with screens, unseen by human eyes, airborne platforms, and its algorithmic analysis is the most prominent example of this today. And I'll just read you a very quick and somewhat technical quotation from Letitia Long, who's a senior American uh, intelligence operation. In the mid-2000s, we saw that geographic intelligence analysts in Iraq and Afghanistan first learned that they could gather data from the analysts, researchers, may also immerse themselves in the ocean by scuba diving or diving with submersibles that permits them to discover new species quickly. Likewise, ABI systems must have the sensors data detect anomalies and alert the analysts. Okay? So sensors, or in an old language, okay. so that's a vision of the fully visible battlefield, not just visual uh, in data terms, is also increasingly subject to contest, complication, regulation, governance, interference in technologies. In a phrase, a second phrase, not only on the screen, war also happens in the ruin, which first emerged in Latin America in the mid-1980s in two apparently different but structurally parallel contexts. The first human rights forensics team in the world was constituted by a group of Argentine students in the summer of 1984, initiated by a forensic anthropologist from the US named Clyde Snow, that's him, who had come there uh, to work um, on the question of, disappear, of the disappeared people from the uh, military regime. The dirty war in Argentina had given the world a new word and concept, the disappeared. The following year, in an ironic inversion of the first context, the state-of-the-art techniques in the forensic identification of missing persons received their most decisive test and worldwide publicity in the international investigation of the body of the Auschwitz doctor, so now we're back to Auschwitz, Joseph Mengele in Brazil. And Clyde Snow testifying in the trial, the first trial of the Argentine junta, um, and showing on the screen the skull of a, a woman who had been kidnapped and uh, disappeared by the, by the army, and they identified her um, from a mass grave. In telling the story of the emergence of forensic operations into the field of human rights, and its complex relation to the historic privilege of the witness and the document, we were struck both by the role that images played in the process. So this is an uh, image from that uh, Mengele identification case, where the decisive technique involved the superimposition of photography, of photographs known to be that of Mengele, and the skull that was uh, exhumed from an unmarked grave, or a, a pseudonymously marked grave. And a German scientist had invented a matching technique, um, which demonstrated that the uh, image and the skull belonged to the same person. So we were struck by the role that images played in this identification process, this forensic identification process, and by the analogy, for lack of a better word, between human remains, bones, and the structure of the photograph. They're both constituted by a complex process of imprinting, a recording of impressions, which enable or provoke some interpretive labor and the possibility of a retelling of that process but also by a fundamental lack of absolute certainty, a debatability or uh, contestability that makes them uh, properly forensic. So the original, the etymological meaning of forensic means belonging to the forum, the place of debate, the place of dispute. So we wrote, to the untrained eye, bones look similar. Skulls are devoid of the expression and the gestures of a human face but the bones of a skeleton are exposed to life in a similar way that photographic film is exposed to light. A life understood as an extended set of exposures to a myriad of forces is projected onto a mutating, growing, and contracting negative, which is the body in life. Like a palimpsest or a photograph with multiple exposures, bones can be quite difficult to interpret.
in them for longer or shorter periods of time. It affects what it accepts. The traces can often be read and interpreted, but they are mute witnesses. Their language is not always or ever unequivocal. They need interpreters, translators, if they are to demonstrate anything persuasively. We are interpreting for the dead, says one famous forensic anthropologist. Around the bones and an image and their complex mix of legibility and inscrutability grows a forum or a space of debate. There are objects in dispute, and more than one interpreter can make claims about what they have to say. I'm going to skip this part of the thing because I think I'm going too slowly. Sometimes evidence is produced automatically. In a sense, that is what the forensic anthropologists confront as they decipher bones, at least in part. Life has left its traces, unauthored and unintended, in and on the bones that remain. But machines can also generate forensic material automatically. Here's an example. On more than one occasion now, X-ray scanners installed at US customs posts on the border with Mexico, and at checkpoints throughout much of Mexico, have generated images that send us back uh, to uh, the age of slavery. Traces of a contemporary trade in people transported in conditions that rival that of centuries earlier. Here's the New York Times captioned this image. When police ran x-ray scanners over two cargo trucks at a checkpoint in southeastern Mexico on Tuesday, they made a surprising discovery. Inside the trailer were the ghostly shadows of 500 migrants, some suffering <coughs> from dehydration, packed together in near suffocating conditions. The police released an image of the harrowing scan, which shows how migrants sat in tight bundles or stood clutching cargo straps for hours of clandestine travel from beyond Mexico's border with Guatemala. So this is an automatically produced image, an automatically read image. The scanners have those very same or uh, very similar algorithms. Uh, to the ones that uh, interpret your suitcase uh, in the airport, and they identify, uh, to use a word uh, that Gregoire used as well, anomalies. They find uh, what oughtn't to be in such an image. Uh, for instance, in this case, uh, 500 uh, upright objects. But what I'm interested in is the way in which that intrusive uh, police or even war fighting technology can become evidence in its own right of a systematic pattern of human rights abuses, can be turned or reused uh, for different ends. And that seems to me to be the second zone in which uh, war is being fought today. In the aftermath of war, uh, human rights analysts, um, non-governmental activists are taking the um, the data bank, the database, uh, which has been produced um, often by military and policing technologies and turning it to other ends. And I'll just show you a couple more images of that. These are images uh, from the Mediterranean from a project, a project called Watch the Med, which attempts to uh, track the pathways of migrant uh, boats coming from the Maghreb uh, into southern Europe, um, but not in order to uh, stop them, not in order to turn them around and send them back, but in order to rescue them, or in order to identify the complicity of the agencies which are tracking them in uh, the um, all too often, uh, into the fact that all too often those boats disappear uh, and their, their cargoes die. So this was a project um, looking at a boat that uh, left Libya during the um, war in Libya, and which was adrift in the Mediterranean for a month, was encountered by numerous warships from the forces fighting in Libya, 
um, but abandoned nonetheless. And they tried using sensor data from satellites, from uh, sensors that uh, track ocean currents, um, and from synthetic aperture radar to show the path of this uh, boat as it wandered around the Mediterranean and show the places where it had intersected uh, and was, uh, could have been rescued by a whole armada of NATO warships. So this is evidence that's produced for other purposes, for finding fish, for, again, uh, for finding fish or for tracking uh, illegal migration. But it's repurposed now for uh, forensic uses in attempting to challenge uh, these states and call them to their responsibilities in, in relation to uh, trafficking and migration. Moment. And on the other hand, however one regards that, the fact that these uh, image collection um, uh, mechanisms are producing massive resources which just need to be excavated uh, in the aftermath um, by those who wish to contest and challenge uh, and advocate uh, for something different than war. Thank you.